Good morning. My name is Wade Griffith. I'm the pastor here at Liberty Crossings, and we're delighted to have you worshiping with us this morning. Will you pray with me and for me? Almighty God, we thank you this day for a time to gather in your house as your people. As we finish our series on Ephesians, rediscovering what our identity is in Christ and how to live out that identity in, in a world that may be hostile to it, I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would speak to every person here today. God, each of us comes with a different issue on our minds, a, a different challenge or a different worry, decision, fear, maybe a different celebration. You know what's going on in each of our lives. And I pray that you would take the meditations of my heart and apply it to each life here, each person, each family, each adult, each child, each young adult. Speak to us, your people. Bless your word, Lord God. Bring it to life. Plant it in our hearts as a seed to righteousness. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we are continuing and concluding our series on Ephesians with a really awesome text that I think has the power within it to be a total game changer in our lives. Right out of the box, something that tomorrow can make everything different. And I realize that that's a a big promise like someone might make in an infomercial, uh, that if you buy this product, tomorrow breakfast will cook itself. And I I realize that, but, but when you hear this last piece from the book of Ephesians, hopefully you'll hear in it what I hear. It's like a locker room speech. And the writer is getting ready to send them out onto the field of battle. Send them out into the game, and he's given them the last piece of information that he can give them. It's like, if you forget everything else I said, here's what you have to do. Do this one thing, and it's going to go so much better for you. Now, in their context, going better wasn't, hey, having a good day. For a lot of us, what we want to have tomorrow is a good day, right? Let's have a good day. Let's have a good week. Let's let good things happen. In the world of the writer of Ephesians, good things happening meant not being killed because you're a Christian. That was their idea of a good day. Uh, for us, is maybe a close parking place to target. You know, it's, it's a little different context for us. But the wisdom within it has equal power and potential to impact our lives for the better. And I, I don't want you to miss that. I want you to see the potent truths that you can take in your hands tomorrow and use it to have a different kind of day, the day that God would will for you to have. When I was thinking about it this week, it got me thinking about something else, something I've been doing for a while here. And I brought a bag with me. Uh, somebody was asking me as I, wa- I walked in with this this morning, someone said, do you need to make a quick getaway today? And I said, that's up to you. <laughs> um, So I brought my bag today. Uh, To many of you, this looks just like an ordinary cheap duffel bag. But in the Griffith family, this is our Nike baseball bag. All right, you know what I'm talking about? That we take our stuff to the ballpark. So I've been doing t-ball with my sons here. Anybody know anything about t-ball? Any t-ball experts out there? No one wants to admit it. I see kind of little hands going up. So my son plays four five-year-old t-ball at Moss Field in Cahaba Heights. Some of you have have worn those bleachers many a year probably. And wh- what I've learned is, is that when we play t-ball over there, it's not enough just to show up at the field, right? You have to have the right equipment, okay? And the right equipment varies from family to family, all right? Maybe some of you noticed this. Uh, there were kids out there who had better equipment than probably... Um, some famous baseball player, all right? I'm more of a football guy, Mickey Mantle. But then, then I thought he, he didn't have probably great gear either. <laughs> but there were kids out there who had baseball gloves, both hands, sunglasses, like you would see on, you know, a major league baseball player. Then the Griffiths roll up out there, okay? With uh, the only one without a real baseball bag. You can imagine how excited my son was when I said, oh, we don't need a bag, we're good. Dad found this in the garage. He was really proud of this. Um, he really appreciated it. So we had to get the helmet, right? One of these days we'll take the stickers off, okay? That's how we find it after the game. Um, 
got her a little baseball bat. I thought I'd shag a few flies to y'all, but uh, the trustees said it was a liability issue. So we won't do that. Got her glove here. Here's our little left-handed glove. And one day we were going out to the field, gathered up all the stuff, put it in the bag, ready to go, get to the field, and I realized that we had forgotten the helmet. All right? Now, when I was a kid, that wasn't an issue because the coach had all the helmets. Does anybody remember that? You didn't have to have your own helmet. I don't know if it's like a, a lice epidemic. I mean, I don't understand. Or if it's, you know, the lobbying of Dick Sporting Goods that changed the rules. If, th if this is a corporate thing that's going on. But you got to have your own helmet or, or you can't play. So I realized that I didn't have the helmet. And I was that parent, you know. Because when I went up to the coach, who, God bless him, is trying to herd these kids around, great guy, I said, hey, coach, we forgot the helmet. He looked at me, okay, like, you know, someone had called DHR on me, all right? He looked at me like I had just stabbed him in the heart with a knife. I kicked his dog, burned his house down. He looked at me so betrayed and so disappointed. I felt like a little kid who had been caught doing something wrong. And I just kind of was like, oh, you know. Was, and he looked at me like I was the worst parent ever. And I said, yeah, you know, I'm really sorry. You know, just all those things you say. We'd been, we were busy. We were running late. And, you know, and I, you know, I'm sounding like a, I'm an eight-year-old, you know. And he goes, he's like, <sighs> he goes, I guess you can wear our helmet. I said, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I, I could see in his mind, he was looking at us, what percentage chance did, are they a, a lice risk? It's like a quick math that went on in his head, like odds of lice with the Griffith family. Somehow we passed, probably because Wade has a summer buzz cut now. <laughs> but, and so he handed us uh, his son's helmet. Now, I got to tell you, his son has an impressively small head, Okay. <laughs> I mean, really small. I'm not saying he's not smart. He's probably smarter than me. But just a, you know, a head, a really tiny, tiny head, right? Small, little tiny head. My son has a pumpkin. Uh, you know, Julie's not here today. I can say stuff like this just for a cheap laugh. Oh, my son has a larger head. So, so I get the helmet. My son's totally embarrassed of me, of course. And I'm like, hey, we're going to wear so-and-so's helmet. And so my son tries to put it on, and it's like, ooh, ooh, you know, and then he just, you know, screams. He's like, he's like, Dad, it's squeezing my brains out. <laughs> I'm like, son, your brains are not coming out. I promise you that. I, I, I was like, I'll help you, which he hates it when I do that. It's like, because in Alabama, if something doesn't fit, what do you do? What do you do? Force it, right? You force it. Come on, people. And so I was like, and I put it down on his head, and his face turned beet red. All the blood pushed right up to his face. And uh, it wasn't a good batting day for my son that day. Um, but we learned a lesson that you have to show up with the right gear. Now, I want to preach with this. I feel manly when I carry this around. All right, listen up. So basically, this is cool, isn't it? Basically the writer of Ephesians, is saying don't show up to the ball field without your equipment for the game or you will lose, you will strike out, you will get beaten. You have to have certain things if you're going to play the game. If you understand that concept, you understand what's being said in Ephesians. I want to look at Ephesians chapter 6. And as you get ready to, to read or look at your Bible, let me just say, it, he's, it's not just about, obviously, baseball. He's talking about life for Christ. He's talking about being victorious, being strong for the Lord. Not against the four-year-old braves, but against our enemy, against Satan and the one who comes to lie and steal and cheat and destroy. He's saying, don't show up to a gunfight with a knife, is what he's saying. He's saying, don't wonder why you failed in the face of temptation when you did nothing to prepare, when God gave you every tool you needed, 
and you used none of them. And then you said, well, I wonder why, why did I do that thing that I, I didn't want to do? Why did, I, why did I fail? When you didn't use anything that God gave you, that's what he's saying. Wear your helmet, bring your bat, be ready to go. Be ready to play the game. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning verse 10. Topic sentence, right out of the gate. Finally, be strong in the Lord. That's what he's telling them how to do. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God. And I read that, and he says it more than one time. I was thinking about one of my favorite movies, really book, The Hobbit. Who here's read The Hobbit? Anybody read The, anybody read the Hobbit? Who, who's read all the Tolkien books, like Lord of the Rings? Some, some people? Okay, so I got some questions for you guys. All right? So in The Hobbit, there was a dragon whose name was Smog. All right, all right. Andrew, you've read, read it over there. E employees can't participate in the contest, okay? <laughs> employees and their families may not participate in this sweepstakes, okay? All right, but you ruined it, so never mind. Anyway, Smog is the guy, the dragon, okay? Bad guy. And when they go to kill Smog, who lives under a mountain, they realize that dragons have, you know, serious armor, scales all over them. And their, their vulnerable spot is their what? Andrew? Huh, belly, that's right, good. But not this dragon, because he's been sleeping for hundreds of years on a bed of, anybody? Jewels, gold, gold jewels, that's right. And so they stuck, so he's encrusted with jewels. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? All right? So how are they going to attack him? Well, they discover that there's one part of him where there's not a jewel. It's like under his arm is this one spot that's not armored. And that's where he's vulnerable. Got me thinking. In our spiritual lives, where are we vulnerable? Don't think for a moment that the enemy doesn't know where you're vulnerable. The question is, do you know where you're vulnerable? He knows. He knows what way of thinking or seeing the world, what weakness you have that he can exploit to lead you to make a disastrous decision, probably starting with little decisions that lead up to a decision that will rob you of your family or your marriage, your legacy, your, your principles, your integrity, your fidelity to God. He knows where the vulnerable spot is. So the writer in Ephesians says, don't just put on the armor you like, put on the whole armor of God. Not just the one you grew up wearing, but this over here you're not familiar with, so, so you're not, you're not going to do that. He says, put on the whole armor of God. We'll talk more about that. So that you may be able to, withstand, able to stand against the wiles of the devil. All right, that word stand comes up several times in this text. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness. He's got a way with words. And if you live in the world I live in, you know a little bit about what he's talking about. Not just in the newspaper or CNN.com or AL.com where you see this present darkness, but hopefully, if you're spiritually awake and alive, the darkness you see in your own heart. In the thoughts you have that you're embarrassed you have. In the unforgiveness. Desire for, for vengeance. The greed, the lust. This present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's what we're against. Not things that would hurt our bodies, but the spiritual force of evil around us. Therefore, take up the whole, oh, there it is again, the whole armor of God, the whole armor of God, the whole thing, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. There's that word again. Now think about this church there in Ephesus. If you missed the last few weeks, um, you can watch the sermons on the website if you want to go back. But the church there in Ephesus, they were being persecuted. They weren't praying to have a good day. They weren't praying to have a, a good meeting with the boss or praying for a raise or praying that it wouldn't rain so the game didn't get rained out at the ball fields. They were praying to be alive. They were praying that they wouldn't get rounded up because of their faith and killed. 
So he tells them a secret to being able to stand up, to stand for what they believe and not be afraid. He's talking about a spiritual thing that God does. If you've ever read the book of Acts, you read about the early disciples, Acts of the Apostles. The book of Acts is about the, the early believers and what they did after Jesus was resurrected and after he ascended into heaven. It's the story of the early church. If you love history, you'll love it. It's awesome. Here's the cool thing about Acts. After Jesus is crucified and resurrected, the disciples, they're still, they're terrified. They're hiding out. They're underground. They are, because of their circumstances, they are secret Christians. And then this thing we talked about last week happens called Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit fell on them. And that spirit of fear was crushed by them, by the Spirit. And all of a sudden, they had this amazing boldness about them. They, they couldn't be threatened. They couldn't be scared. They couldn't be stopped. And, and, and they told Peter, stop preaching or we're going to have you put in jail or execute. He said, I can't stop. I, I have to say this. I have to tell about Jesus. And they were fearless. They went from fearful to fearless because of the Holy Spirit. That's the difference. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Destroys fear and reinforces and gives provision for God's purposes. So we read this and we see that that's one of the things that's being offered to the early church through the Holy Spirit. I'm going to hurt myself with this. Better put that down. <laughs> I'm going to hit myself. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on the evil day and having done everything, stand firm. And here's how you do it. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist. First thing, know the truth. Know the truth. Start there. That'll hold your pants up wherever you are. That'll hold you together. That'll hold everything together. Know the truth. And what's the truth he's talking about? I believe the truth he's talking about is that Jesus is Lord, period. That's it. Jesus is Lord, Lord of all creation. Start there with that truth that's foundational to your life, your sense of identity, your purpose, that Jesus is Lord. And that is the first piece of the armor that you have to have. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. A big piece of armor right here. Now most of us probably don't think of ourselves as righteous. Most of us don't think of ourselves as holy, probably. We'd feel maybe weird calling ourselves those things. But he's not talking about being self-righteous. He's not talking about putting yourself out there as some example that everybody else should follow. He's talking about the righteousness of Jesus. That because you follow Jesus, who was righteous, you get to wear his righteousness. That's a tough concept, but you get the benefit of what Jesus did. You get his righteousness at work in your life. And that righteousness has a power within it. Fasten the belt of truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, I love this, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. He's not telling them to hide out so they won't get in trouble. Okay? Just the opposite. He's saying... Put on your feet whatever's going to take you where you need to go to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And with all of these, take the shield of faith. Take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Flaming arrows. There was a time in my life where I, that probably wouldn't have meant a lot to me. But as I've gotten older, I've seen that the enemy does throw flaming arrows at us. And it's, it's our faith in God that protects us. That knowing that God is with us, knowing that God is for us. God never says it's going to be easy. What he says is, I am with you. And our faith is that he has triumphed in the end. He will win this war. And that he is trustworthy and that he is with me and for me. And it's that faith that not only blocks those arrows, but according to this, quenches them. 
And then take the helmet of salvation, the knowledge that I am saved is the way I understand that. And the word of God, the word of the, excuse me, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's the armor that he talks about. All those things. And when I was reading that, what I realized is that most days, or at least some days, I walk into battle without any armor on. And then I wonder, maybe, why I get beaten. Why I didn't make the right choice, do the right thing. And as I'm reading this, I'm thinking that this plays out in our lives in the way that we start our days. How many of you start your day with an alarm set on one of these? Anybody? Okay. So this is right next to your head, okay, right? On your table, I see some people elbowing each other, uh, just like last week's sermon on husbands and wives. Uh, and, And this thing goes off. Okay, what's the temptation that comes next when this little evil device goes off first thing in the morning? What's the temptation to do next? All right? Take it and do what? Snooze. You've been reading my reading my mind. Um, hit that little button there that says email because you know whatever email I got at one a.m. it must be urgent, right? Uh, you know I, I have to read it immediately or the world may come to an end, right? I mean I'm that important that whatever email I got at one a.m. must be read immediately or you know life will end as we know it, right? My kids won't eat, you know. So maybe I check the email or worse. Maybe I go to that big blue F on there, right? For fail. That's what that means. <laughs> fail. The, the writer, Lisa Turkhurst, talks about how we start our days. And she ministers to women, is a great speaker. And she talks about how the way we start our day usually determines how we feel at the end of the day. That you can start your day off in a way that will probably determine whether it's a good day. And in the world we live in, starting off with the big blue F, a.k.a. Facebook, or other things, a lot of times the first thing we look at makes us feel left out, less than, or lonely. Left out because you see the dinner party you weren't invited to, (laughs) or whatever. Less than because someone else has something you don't have, has more than you, or lonely. Because, you know, on Facebook, everyone's happy, right? All the time. Everybody's happy all the time. It's amazing. Not reality, but amazing. And so you start your day feeling less than, left out, or lonely. All the things that are lies of the enemy. Because as believers, we're not less than, we're more than because we have Christ. We're not left out. We've been included by the blood of Christ and the cross. And we're not lonely. We have a family of believers around us and a God who loves us and with us. So our day is started out with lies, things that aren't true. And she challenges people don't to start with those things, less than left out and lonely, but to start with the God who loves us and who is with us and for us. To start our day in his word. To start our day in a way that reminds us who we are. I bet most of you have heard of the basketball coach, Bobby Knight, kind of evil genius of basketball, right? Chair thrower, extraordinaire, kind of a crazy basketball guy. He was the coach of the Indiana Hoosiers. He said something one time that, that I think relates to this, the armor of God, how we start our day, how what we do to start our day determines the day, whether we make the right decisions during the day, whether we overcome temptation. He said these words, The key is not the will to win. Everybody has that. Who wants to lose? The key is not the will to win. Everybody has that. It is the will to prepare to win that is important. The key is not the will to win. Everybody has that. That doesn't differentiate you from anybody. The key is to have the will to prepare to win. That is what is important. To be prepared. To be equipped. 
to start the day with a meeting with the boss to hear and be reminded what the priorities are for the day. Number one, who you are. Number two, who he is. Number three, what his will is for you today. That is success. That is the path to abundant life. That is a game changer to put on that armor of God by being in prayer, being in the word, which is a form of worship, devoting our attention and our eyes and our minds to God to start the day off. That's worship. And I think the whole armor of God also includes to experience those things and being a part of a small group of believers. We're not intended to go it alone. The enemy wants you to go it alone because you're vulnerable. God, starting with Jesus, made a small group, disciples, early church, house churches, small groups. Everything in Scripture says don't go it alone. We're made for relationship with our Creator and with other believers where we journey together. That is part of the armor that God has given us. When we start in the Word, God takes our mind off what we want that day, what we're worried about, what we're th- me, me, all my stuff. It's in the morning when I look at that phone, it's like the wolves come in, man. They start just eating me alive. <laughs> you know, yesterday's to-do list that's now on top of today's to-do list. And, and then, uh, you know, i got to write that note. I, you know, I, and all of a sudden, I'm just the wolves just pull me apart. Let me ask you this. Who's the Prince of Peace? Do you know him? Why don't you start your day with breakfast with him? The Prince of Peace. We start our day with God. We start thinking not about what we don't have, We start thinking about what we do have. We're not thinking about me. We're thinking about people we know and and their suffering and and their reality. We start thinking about the purposes of God, not the purposes of Wade. And that leads to humility. C.S. Lewis said, true humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. True humility isn't Wade, you're an idiot, you're dumb, you're no good. That's Satan talking. That's not the voice of God, my perfect Father in heaven who loves me and created me. That's not his voice. And that's not humility. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Which means God and other people more beginning our day with god the secret to the spiritual life is found in a very unexpected place in the bible and putting on the armor of god in the morning to me that's that's what we're talking about is is the spiritual life being a spiritual person life in the spirit which begins each morning with god the the whole secret to the spiritual life is in a very unexpected place if you have your bibles and want to look it up mark chapter 1 verse 35 This is it. Ready? Bated breath. This is the secret. You ready for the secret? Big secret. Drum roll. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Here we go. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up. Jesus got up, went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. Now, I thought it'd be cool after I read that. That'd be like a great one. I could just drop the mic and walk off. Isn't that been cool? Dramatic? Just drop the mic and walk. Steve said I couldn't do that. These things are expensive, come to find out. That's the secret right there. Don't miss it because you were looking for something more sophisticated or more appropriate to your level of education and intelligence. Don't, don't miss this. This is the secret right here. It, it, it's, it's confounding to the wise. Because it's the simplicity of God. In the morning, while it was still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place, parenthetically, by himself, and there he prayed. There he put on the armor of God. Paul explains this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He explains it in a way that even I can understand. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
Don't be like everyone else around you. Don't be like this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds, which to me is putting on that armor of God, being in the Word, being in prayer. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Why? Why? So that you may discern what is the will of God. So that you can see as God sees and, and know the right decisions to make, the right people to take extra time with, to stop and encourage and to love on them. Uh, what, the, what are the right words to say? How to avoid not just the temptation, but to e- even avoid the situation of temptation. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. It's not the will to win. Everybody has that. It's the will to prepare to win that matters. Which is why Jesus got up in the morning before the rest of the disciples and would steal away, would go off by himself to be alone with God. To go to his, his spiritual filling station, his spiritual gas station, to be filled up with that Holy Spirit again. His brother in the Trinity, to invite that in, to, to plug himself into the the wall socket, get that electricity of God flowing, that power that he needed, that Jesus needed. Get me? (laughs) That Jesus, the Son of God, needed. You get me? You see where I'm going with this? That Jesus needed? That he got up early in the morning so that he could have time with God? Think about it. That's it. That's how we put on the armor of God. St. Francis of Assisi may have summed it up best when he said this. Start the day by doing what's necessary. Then do what's possible. And suddenly, you're doing the impossible. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, will you pray with me? Almighty God, thank you for the fact that that you don't send us out as lambs to the slaughter. You don't leave us to our own devices. You don't say, hey, go out there and don't sin and and, and lead people to me and, and do great things. Good luck. No, God, you come with us. And you've offered us all the tools of your Holy Spirit to prepare us. Lord, we ask you for one more thing. You've already offered us all these tools, all this armor. I hesitate to do it, God, but, but, but I want to ask you for one thing more. Just one more thing on top of all that. It's ridiculous that I would ask for anything more, God, but I want to ask for, for one more thing. Lord, give us the wisdom to take this armor to put it on to not just hear about it and go home but to live in it that every day might be about glorifying you number one and number two pointing someone else to you may our lives bring glory to your name Lord God may our lives point others to you Help us to put on that armor that we need to overcome the enemy, the spiritual forces of darkness in this world, the the truth of evil that is around us at work so that we can stand for you, Lord God, and we can stand for the weak among us who are attacked or, or hurt like Jesus did. We can stand with and for those who are marginalized or like the lepers of Jesus' day that, that he went out So we have the courage to to stand up, God, to stand for you and with you. Give us the wisdom to put on your armor, for we ask it in Jesus' name.